Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angela Papalia. I'm the Assistant Director of the Adelphi New York Statewide Breast Cancer Hotline and Support Program. It's a pleasure to host this program today entitled Five Things to Know About Breast Cancer and Breast Reconstruction. Um, we are, have the privilege of being joined here this afternoon by Dr. David Parrish. Um, and it's a pleasure to have him talk as a board certified plastic surgeon this morning. I'm going to do a brief introduction in just a moment to Dr. Parrish. Um, but before I begin, just a few housekeeping items. Please make sure that if you would not like to be uh, recorded, that your video is off. This session will be recorded and then played and placed on our website for the Adelphi New York Statewide Breast Cancer Program. If you have any questions, you will be able to put them into the, the chat and Dr. Parrish will be fielding those questions at the end of his presentation. This program this morning is also being translated and interpreted simultaneously into Spanish. If you would like to utilize the Spanish language option, please do so by clicking the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. We will also be placing in the chat today our program evaluation. So please take a moment at the end of the program to fill that out as it does help us to shape future programming. Okay. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. David Parrish. Um, we are thrilled to have him join us here this morning. And Dr. Parrish is a board certified plastic surgeon and joined New York Plastic Surgical Group, a division of Long Island Plastic Surgical Group in the fall of 2021. Offering a full range of reconstructive and cosmetic surgical procedures, Dr. Parrish specializes in acute adult and pediatric burns, scars, and complex reconstructive wounds, as well as aesthetic procedures, including body contouring, rhinoplasty, and surgical and non-surgical facial rejuvenation. He holds many, many responsible and exemplary titles in the community, and it is a pleasure to have you here this morning with us, Dr. Parrish. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Angela, for that introduction. I really appreciate it, and thank you, everyone uh, who's joined thus far. I see we have about 20 people uh, with us. Uh, I appreciate your time, whether you're here for yourself or for your loved ones. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today, and um, we'll be uh, talking, as Angela noted, uh, about uh, things that you should know regarding breast cancer uh, and uh, breast cancer reconstruction. Um, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll try to get to them, and I'll stay as long as I need to uh, so that we could finish them uh, towards the end. Um, just wanted to take the time to uh, recognize the Adelphi statewide uh, breast cancer program. Uh, I had no idea it went back to 1980 that they've been doing this wonderful, beautiful work. So uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone who participated in organizing this event, who continues to do this really important and meaningful work. Uh, I really appreciate you guys hosting me today. Uh, so uh, about me, like Angela said, I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, board certified in general plastic surgery and uh, part of the New York Plastic Surgical Group. Uh, I have offices in East Hills and Garden City, uh, director of the uh, uh, county burn unit specializing in complex reconstruction and microvascular surgery. Uh, I have privileges at uh, hospitals throughout uh, Long Island. Uh, I'm passionate about my uh, two boys and really just making my patients feel whole uh, as they're going through life-changing circumstances, um, which oftentimes are scary. Um, having said that, one important thing that I, I want everyone to know, uh, again, whether you're here for yourself or for uh, a family member, is uh, that uh, in this family, no one fights alone. And I'd like everybody, I think uh, I'll speak for the Adelphi uh, statewide uh, breast uh, program uh, and the New York Plastic Surgical Group. We want to be part of your family. We want to help. We want to uh, be there for you to help answer questions and to be there for you uh, in order to um, uh, guide you through this uh, time um, as it can be very overwhelming. So once you have your team, and we'll talk about a little more of what your team uh, will consist of, um, the number one, two, and three goals, I believe, uh, that you should be focusing on is beating the uh, breast cancer. And the reason why I say that is because reconstruction is part 
of the journey, part of the battle and recovery, uh, but it is not a priority. I, I wouldn't put it in the top three. Uh, reconstruction could always be done at a later time once we accomplish uh, the immediate goal, which is just beating the cancer. And um, we'll go into this a little bit further. So today I'll be talking an overview of a few things. What are the options? Um, coverage, does insurance cover it? Um, what procedure is the right procedure for you? Uh, what is the role of the plastic surgeon? And uh, really how to choose a plastic surgeon to begin with. So there are several reconstructive options and I try to break it down in a simple way for my patients where I talk about the skin envelope, the breast volume, the nipple and areola, and the use of your own tissues versus implants to fill that breast volume that you may or may not be missing, including the skin envelope. And all of this is dependent on type of cancer that you have. All of this is dependent on uh, what we need to do to keep you safe and to beat cancer. So the skin env envelope is exactly what it sounds like. It, it, it's uh, your breast in itself. And depending on the cancer, you may need to have some or all of the breast removed. If the skin is removed, uh, there are two options really for uh, having it replaced. Uh, one option is we stretch the skin that is remaining. And that is uh, by way of going through a tissue expander. And then the other option is you bring tissue from elsewhere in order to replace it one for one. Uh, this could be done by way of flaps, uh, similar to the one you're seeing on the right of your screen. It's your own tissue, and we'll go over the benefits of each one and how they differ a little further. But broad picture is the skin envelope of the breast may be affected. If it is, we either have to replace it with uh, expanding the skin that is there or bringing new skin uh, with it. With the skin potentially being affected by the cancer and the treatment of cancer, similarly, your breast volume may be affected. So that's the inside of the breast. So the breast volume, once affected, uh, and we have to reconstruct it, could be reconstructed in a way to make the breast about the same size or smaller. There is an option to go a little bigger, but not much. Uh, and oftentimes, because their skin being removed, Going bigger, especially if you're not using more complex reconstructive techniques, could be a little riskier and challenging. Uh, and again, that volume, it's important to, again, recognize that you're replacing it with your own tissue or implants, similar uh, to the skin envelope. So what are some differences between implants and your own tissue? Well, implants could be placed immediately at the time of surgery, or if we need to stretch skin because we need to get a larger size, we then do it in two surgeries. Uh, doesn't require me taking tissue from another side of your body, uh, that other side of your body, and we'll talk about uh, what, what's available, uh, what is your donor site. So your donor site would be another area of recovery from the surgery. So an implant doesn't have another donor site. An implant introduces something foreign into your body. And this is a separate topic of its own, whether it's a saline implant, a silicone implant, a tissue expander to stretch that skin envelope, like I mentioned. Um, it's a foreign object in your body. A flap uh, is your own tissue. Your own tissue, there's lots of uh, it's, it's also called an autologous reconstructive option. Uh, these are all different keywords that you may um, see and read about through Dr. Google, friends, family. Uh, and there are different flap options available. Those are some abbreviations, a TRAM, a DEEP, SGAP, IGAP, uh, latissimus dorsi, PAP, lots of technical terms. But the idea is you take your own tissue to reconstruct out of the skin, and or the breast. It's a longer surgery. You're dealing with smaller vessels, usually, um, and uh, thus slightly longer recovery. Everything we talk about today and going forward 
um, really has to be individualized to your needs. Um, if you're not having a large degree of breast volume removed, a, a, a flap is not necessary if it's just a lumpectomy that you're dealing with. So this is a, is a lot to coordinate with your breast surgeon. This is a lot to coordinate with your goals, your aesthetic goals, which you're allowed to have. Um, and you really just need to utilize your team, okay? Utilize your support network at home, uh, utilize your, your surgeons uh, and your oncology team. So going to your own tissue for reconstruction, you could get it from your tummy. This is me saying this without those technical terms. You could get it from uh, your backside. You could get it from your thighs, or you could get it from your back. Well, not everybody could get some tissue taken away from their tummy if they don't have extra tissue to take. So this is what I mean by an individualized approach depending on the options available to you, depending on what your goals are like, depending on what you want to recover from and go through. Uh, and uh, as we'll get to uh, down the road, there is no right answer. So implants, potentially similarly confusing. Should I get an allergen? What about Cientro? What about Mentor? They're all very similar. When I do the ordering, the most important thing that I need to know is what is the volume of breast that I am replacing? What is the width of your breast that you currently have if we have a skin envelope to replace? And based on that, you could go to any of these manufacturers and place an implant. It really doesn't matter. It's all overwhelming. Not one is better than the other. I would just leave it to your surgeon to guide you through the process, but really, the goals are to give you the result that you're looking for and to make it natural. And most importantly, again, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, to beat the cancer, to beat the cancer, to beat the cancer. Some of you, and, and this is also for elective procedures, uh, may ask, well, what about implant placement? Where do I place it? Do I place it above the muscle? Do I place it below the muscle? Again, it depends on your um, goals, the breast tissue that's present, and what, what you're trying to accomplish. Certainly, if we're removing a large portion of the breast and um, there um, will be skin removed and you're going to go through an implant-based reconstruction, most of the time, you're going to have it at least partly below the muscle, and that's for padding so that you have a more natural result. Uh, certainly, uh, just recently, I've done a patient who had a lumpectomy, but was smaller and wanted fuller breasts. So we had an implant below her normal tissue. Um, and it was a discussion whether to have it above or below the muscle. If you're using autologous reconstruction, which is your own tissue from a part of your body, most of the time you're not using an implant. Again, can you? Sure. I, I, but I think that most of the time people choose that route because they don't want to deal with an implant. Uh, they don't want to deal potentially with something far. And again, there's nothing wrong with going through that route of getting an implant. There's also nothing wrong with getting uh, your own tissue for reconstruction. But do note that somewhere along the line of uh, conversation, this may come up somewhere along the line of your reading. And again, it has to do with where you place it. Is it below this muscle? Is it above the muscle? Is there breast tissue? Is there missing skin? That's the theme that I'm trying to get across. Your nipple and areola, some cancers actually require its removal. Some do not. Priority is the cancer and the treatment of the cancer. Just know that we could always reconstruct it with your own tissue, or we could just tattoo it. In our group, we have a wonderful tattoo artist. She does some of her own work. A lot of people go to her and they're very happy. Similarly, you could get it um, uh, reconstructed with your own tissue that's present. So it really just depends. But the priority is just declaring war on cancer. So insurance coverage. So according to the uh, American Cancer Society, um, the Women's and uh, Cancer Rights Act 
uh, helps to protect many women with breast cancer who choose to have breast reconstruction after a mastectomy. So this federal law requires most group insurances uh, that cover mastectomies to also cover breast reconstruction. And this includes procedures on the non-affected breast. So everything is covered, including potentially needing revisions, even down the road. So you always have that financial support. So which procedure is right for you? So this is kind of like that Goldilocks uh, story, right? Too cold, too hot, just right. We're each gonna have, or you're each going to have a preference and an answer for what procedure you may be more in favor of. Uh, there's not one right answer. There's lots of options like I was just discussing uh, that allow for us to just get you through this safely. The key thing that I could say is, is just use your team. Talk to your family, talk to your oncologist, talk to your breast surgeon, talk to your plastic surgeon, more importantly, who can give you these options, sit down with you and talk things over with you to explain everything that's available to you. And for me, I think the best option is the one you feel most comfortable with. The best option is the one that meets your needs and your goals. And this depends on the cancer type, treatment, your health and recovery. And again, like I was mentioning, your body type. Again, we wanna get you home safely to your family. And together we'll decide which procedure is the best option for you for a successful breast reconstruction. I think one of the keys is involving a plastic surgeon from the beginning. This is all very confusing, overwhelming, scary. It's a topic that I think is best layered and layered through lots of different resources that the Delphi uh, Statewide Breast Cancer Support Program has, perhaps uh, uh, friends, loved ones, other support groups, uh, surgeons, you just have to layer and come up with thoughtful questions. There are no silly questions. Um, you need someone to guide you through the various options available to sit and listen to your needs and goals. Plastic surgeons work closely with breast surgeons to uh, manage uh, the full spectrum of your reconstructive journey and process. So how can you confidently choose a plastic surgeon? Well, it's critical that each patient uh, feels confident in their choice. Um, uh, there's lots of different surgeons out there, but you have to feel comfortable with them. To share a personal story, it always comes to mind when, when we talk about the subject was my father uh, when he was battling cancer. In the end, it didn't matter who he chose. It was a very late stage cancer, uh, but he needed to choose someone he was comfortable with and someone that could listen to him and someone that could help guide him and someone that could uh, uh, hear his needs, even if maybe they weren't realistic. And that was, he was in a very particular position. Um, but I, I thought that it brought him peace, being able to trust his team around him that guided him through that process. Um, I would make sure that my surgeon was board certified, that he had training in breast reconstruction. And, and an important uh, fact, which is a, a really big experience and support network. Um, I know our group has uh, 24 surgeons. Um, we participate and help run a residency program in several different hospitals. Um, so there's lots of resources that are around and uh, a 75 year reputation. Um, having said that, this is no different from any other major healthcare network uh, across the country. You just want to have a good team that's in your corner uh, to help guide you. Um, that was a very brief overview. I just wanted to answer a few questions that were brought up because I think that the best way to layer some of this material is really through questions. I think that they tease out things that you may have heard. I think that they um, help um, solidify big ideas and concepts. 
So somebody brought up a really good question and it had to do with Allegan implant recall, specifically uh, due to breast implant associated uh, lymphoma. So the question was along the lines of what, what should we do if we have implants? Should we be taking them out? Uh, what is the goal? So there are no official recommendations, but you can have them removed. Uh, the implants are only associated with uh, textured implants. So if you had a textured implant uh, at any point, uh, that's some consideration uh, to have uh, to exchange it for um, a smooth implant. Um, there are people that do capsulectomies, and that's removal of the scar tissue and capsule that the breast is under. And there's a lot of advertisement, I think, about that, completing an end block capsulectomy, a total capsulectomy. I removed all of the scar tissue. From the technical standpoint, I think that it's important to say, are we treating a disease process or are we doing this in case? And the idea that somebody's doing a total capsule removal it's just that it's an idea. Unless you're treating an actual disease process, it's not really indicated. So you just want to get through the removal of some capsule, um, even if you leave a little bit behind. If you're not treating a disease process, but you're getting out of this safely, I think it's more important because sometimes people forget that it's on top of the ribs, inquiring a major dissection uh, that could lead to more bleeding, more pain, and it's not necessary. So uh, I would say that uh, as an aside, and my personal plug about end block capsulectomies. Um, other than that, uh, I think that you certainly can have them removed if you had a history of textured implants. If they've always been smooth, then I wouldn't worry. Uh, I would just uh, follow the, the screening guidelines, uh, obtaining an MRI. Um, again, reconstruction is your choice, just like a breast reconstruction from uh, uh, the very beginning. Uh, it's safe to have uh, them in, it's safe to take them out. Uh, to, to deal with the, uh, res the residual breast tissue and just uh, to, to do a lift uh, if needed. Saline only, if you've only had saline implants, they've not been associated, breast implant associated lymphoma to date. Uh, there's another cancer out there, very infrequent, but breast implant associated squamous cell. So not to confuse the picture further, I just said only textured are bad, bad. And it's really a certain type of textured. It's large textured implants. Um, but now breast implant associated squamous cell is associated with smooth implants as well. So really the way that I look at it, and I think that more data needs to come is some people have a foreign body that they react to more. Uh, they react to that and it forms scar tissue around it naturally, but that scar tissue could be a little more robust. And um, this is just my thought on the process. I think it helps explain things a little further. Um, people are prone to cancers for different reasons. If you smoke, you're more likely to. Um, but I think that that ongoing reaction to a foreign body inflammation potentially may lead to some of these cancers, which not everybody's really predisposed to. So uh, at, at this point, we don't have genetic testing to say, this is the correct dose of medications that you're supposed to take. This is how you're going to scar. You're going to have this reaction to implants. It just doesn't exist. Medicine is not that advanced. So just know that there are cancers associated with breast implant associated ALCL, much less frequently squamous cell. Textured implants, I think most people are shying away from. And the reason why they're shying away from those uh, uh, textured implants um, is because they've been associated with uh, breast in, uh, implant associated lymphoma. Uh, and squamous cell uh, is associated with smooth implants. Um, someone asked about fat grafting and transfer. So that's getting liposuction, storing the fat, processing the fat, and then placing it into your breast. I look at this as more of an adjunct technique. You have implants, you have some skin, some fat, but not a lot of breast tissue. So this could be added to that. But the goal is not to uh, use this alone uh, to reconstruct a breast. Uh, people are doing that electively for uh, breast augmentations, but you have to remember there's a skin envelope what covers the, the inside of the breast, 
the inside of the breast, which may have been removed. You can't just put fat in that area. Uh, so it's usually an adjunct technique used with implants uh, in order to help achieve a certain aesthetic, to fine tune at a little volume. It can be repeated. So some people could have more than one fat grafting, and it's usually for the upper poles of the breast. Capsular contractures, I kind of briefly uh, touched upon this. So what are capsular contractures? They're scar tissue that's around the breast. And if this scar tissue is excessive, it could distort the breast. Part of the reason why we put it underneath the muscle is because there's an extra layer so that it may not be shown. And there are different grades of co contractures as well. This is something that can be fixed with revisional breast reconstructive surgery and is also covered, obviously. How do you avoid capsular contractures? Good technique. Avoid infection. Try not to have bleeding. Uh, so it's surgeon dependent. But in the midst of everything, I think there's some genetic component to it as well in regards to how you scar. And uh, there was a, a comment on radiation changes and causes. So what does radiation do? Although it's part of the treatment for cancer and it's wonderful and it's helpful and it's useful, it could cause anything from mild to severe skin changes and ulcerations that could be treated. It could lead to some scarring and hardening of the residual breast. If that's the case, it could also be treated. Uh, can cause some small vessels to die in the skin, and that's what leads to the ulceration and hardening in the scar tissue. And that you may not see this immediately, but further down the road. And these are things that other people could talk to you about, but this is why you stay friends with your plastic surgeon throughout, because they help you with all of these things if you were to ever come across them. If for some reason the skin is not good in this area, it can be replaced just like at the uh, initial reconstruction of your breasts. And the whole area could be replaced um, by doing a, a, a tissue transfer. And again, this is why you keep your plastic surgeon as part of your family, as part of your support network from the very beginning of your journey to now. Um, please feel free to take a, a screenshot of it. That is my email address. Um, so take a picture, uh, email me anytime. I uh, promise I will get back to you. Uh, any questions that I may not have answered, uh, I uh, promise that I will um, um, answer. Um, just wanted to again uh, thank the uh, Adelphi Breast Cancer Program. I, I try to keep it brief and, and uh, 30,000 foot overview because I think it's more helpful. Um, but I am very happy to take questions. Uh, I'm checking right now. Um, Dr. Parrish, we do have two questions in the chat, if, may, if I may interject. Um, yes, sure. Thanks so much. Uh, one participant had shared she recently had an exchange of a silicone implant uh, from a mastectomy that she had two years ago. She recently learned that the implant was placed pre-pectorally but learned that it had flipped over. Her question is, how does this happen? And is there any way that it can be prevented? So when they say they had a new implant, the, the new implant was placed pre-pectorally. So uh, two things come to mind. Um, was the old implant also pre-pectoral? Uh, did you go down a size? Uh, did you make a new plane, um, which is a new pocket? Because remember, I said that you could you could always go from underneath the muscle to above the muscle, and vice versa. Um, so those are questions to to help answer for her case specifically. But big picture, and there is a reason why I I was I was answering um, uh, some of the key points for this by breaking it down to skin envelope and volume, and that's because if your skin envelope that you have is filled with slightly smaller volume. It's just putting a smaller balloon inside of a bag. Forgive me for, for oversimplifying a, a, a breast. That's not what I'm meaning to do. But 
you could you could see how if it's not filled all the way, you could just easily flip around it. Similarly, if you had scar tissue around an implant that you went down on size of that implant, it could move. Sometimes you may release the scar tissue and the implant uh, could slide over one way or another. So this really has to do with having an envelope and a volume that fills and a mismatch between the two where the implant has an opportunity to move. Can you tighten the pocket that the implant lives in? Yes, revisional surgery. Is that the first thing you should do? I would probably try this. This is a very reasonable, safe option where we can uh, manipulate the implant and um, put it back in its natural position. If it keeps happening, this is something that um, is an option for you. Does that Thank answer you. Our, your question? Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say who this is from. I know it's public, but... Um, she had shared uh, it was too wide and it had flattened when she moved her arm and it was painful. She had fat transfer to shape it, uh, but the fat had dissolved. So yeah, and, that's and the fat that dissolves, you could always put it back in. That's why I said sometimes you have multiple ones in order to be uh, uh, receptive of mm -hmm. any foreign tissue like fat, which comes without vessels. Uh, you need blood supply. So if you had uh, radiation there, it may not have good take. Uh, the textbook says 50 to 80% of the fat that you put will stay. Really, I think it depends on, um, uh, it, it really depends on how you process the fat. Uh, but she's sharing that there, there, there was no radiation, which I said affects small blood vessels. Um, and uh, uh, Again, she was saying that it was too wide and flattened when she moved the arm and painful. So I think that that has to do with the scar tissue that was around it. Perhaps the scar tissue that was around the initial implant was a bit tight. They released it. They created a bigger space. They put in the same size. Now it could flip around. So the question is, is uh, should you uh, have anything done? It's really hard to, uh, and I try not to you know, give advice because it has to be specific for you. I will say that is an option. I will also say, uh, if you give it more time, you may not have this ever come back again. So why rush? So I think it's a personal decision. And this is why you just need whoever you're working with to help guide you to see how you're suffering um, and, and, and to balance your needs. And certainly you wanna put all this behind you and you don't wanna be done. But this is a good example of where uh, although the initial investment for the surgery where you use your own tissue is a longer recovery, you don't really have the problem with implants flipping over and main maintenance and scar tissue. It's not in the same way. Having said that, just because you do a big 8, 10, 12-hour surgery doesn't mean it's, it'll be successful, especially in radiation. There is a possibility that that surgery won't be successful. It's very small, but it's a possibility. So again. This is, these, these are layered conversations that uh, are important to have with your team. Thank you so much, Dr. Parrish. We have another question. Um, and the, this participant had shared she had a lobectomy in 2017 and an implant before her treatment. Um, it was never removed. She had radiation and chemotherapy and the old implant was kept, but now it's rippling and it's painful. So the broader question is, does insurance cover this reconstructive surgery five years later? Yeah. The answer, the short answer is yes. And I think right. that what maybe your concern is, is that you initially had a breast augmentation and the breast augmentation is now completely null and void because you're dealing with a, 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 a battle on uh, cancer. And uh, the insurance companies, like I was mentioning, covers that because it's under a totally different thing now. So you have a, uh, a capsular contracture as a result of your treatment and you need a secondary reconstruction uh, a release of that capsule, likely. Remember that tight pocket that's squeezing down. Uh, maybe a change of position of your implant, maybe fat grafting. Um, and again, all these things have to do with exam, body type, goals. Some people say, please make them smaller. Okay. It's easier if you're having a lipectomy and you do a reduction. No implants, no anything. You're done. Other people say, no, I, I really enjoyed the way that I look. I deserve to look this way. And absolutely everybody does. What are my options? And, um, that go back to what we've been talking about uh, for uh, uh, for the duration of this talk. 
So. Excellent. We have another question that came in. It's regarding the issue of donor tissue or donor skin. And the attendee had asked, under what circumstances can donor skin or tissue be utilized, if any at all, through reconstructive surgery? So this has to go do, if I'm understanding the question correctly, with implant versus autologous reconstruction or your own tissue. And your own tissue could be used uh, at any point from the very beginning. If you're having something like a lumpectomy, um, I don't think that, and this is something I mentioned earlier, I don't think that you would be firing a, a big surgery in order to uh, achieve volume in that way. Um, similarly, if you have uh, radiation changes, um, there are local options uh, where you don't have to redo the plumbing and you take your own tissue on what I would refer to as like a leash, uh, on a, a pedicle where you have your own tissue, say, off your back, off a, a blood vessel where you don't do surgery on the blood vessels and you move it over to the side. Uh, if you are going to require a larger uh, degree of tissue, you could always take it from your tummy, from your thigh from your backside, and, and that does require you to work on small tissues, but you could always go through using your own tissue from the very beginning. Uh, for smaller things where you have a lumpectomy and a small um, uh, deficit in volume, uh, that's where fat grafting comes in. That I would qualify that as your own tissue as well. However, uh, it doesn't require big surgery, just liposuction which some people really like and enjoy because you get a secondary benefit of, well, you have a slightly smaller waist, although that's not the, the goal, depends on how much you're taking. Uh, but this is why looking at your body type, looking at what your goals are, someone could suggest what are the best options for you and what will, will, will achieve your, your goals. Thank you. Something that comes up so often from patients, Dr. Parrish, is when a woman is newly diagnosed, and they have all of the appointments. You, you meet with the oncologist, you meet with the breast surgeon, you meet with the, re, the plastic surgeon about reconstruction, if that's something that's of interest. You know, it's such a whirlwind for patients. Can you just speak to for a minute about the issue of perhaps delaying reconstruction if someone is really on the fence about pursuing reconstructive surgery and a specific type because it's just so much at once. Can you speak to that in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number one, two, and three goals are just uh, beating the cancer, getting home safely to your family, being with your family. So reconstruction is always going to be an option later on. Um, it, uh, some people prefer to focus on one thing at a time, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, it goes back to, again, the concept of an envelope and volume. If you had a lumpectomy, uh, there's certainly prosthetics and uh, paddings that you could use in order to make up for the smaller degree of volume loss. If you had a complete mastectomy where you have larger volume loss, it's the same exact thing. Uh, in that case specifically, you have a skin envelope that you don't stretch in the beginning. And I think the only difference would be is, is that with time, the more time passes, that skin just loses that memory and gets a little flatter. And if you're not having a reconstruction, then chances are you're going to be in the camp of using your own tissue if you delay it. Versus if you have some degree of your own tissue and you just, uh, some there's a, there's a movement of people just going flat mm -hmm. and uh, they just want everything out. They just want to be flat. And that's perfectly acceptable. But because you're taking care of all that extra skin envelope that you once had, or even if you had a little bit, it just just loses its memory and get, becomes flat. It's now much harder to stretch to then fill that volume, whether it's with your own tissue or whatnot. So now how do you bring all that skin there? A flap using your own tissue. You could still couple it with an implant. You could couple it with just fat grafting if you're using your latissimus, depending on your body type and size. But the point is, is that you're incorporating more so your own tissue if you're delaying reconstruction because you, you're lacking that skin envelope. Uh, the volume, again, varies on your goals, but uh, that's the only, I wouldn't even call it a downside. It's just a reality that you have to replace like with like, and uh, it has to come from your body. So if you don't have that skin envelope, if you went flat, if you just said, deal with the cancer first, I'll do the reconstruction later. No problem. You could just bring tissue from another site later, but it would likely be in the form of autologous, your own tissue flap reconstruction. 
That's very helpful. And I, I think it's very comforting to hear directly from a renowned surgeon as yourself, because there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress in the beginning when someone's going through a diagnosis. And certainly, you know, we interface so often with some of your patients at the practice. Um, and it's wonderful for women and men to know that they can always call our program and our hotline being a wonderful resource because we're really able to match people up for specialty calls. So for example, if someone's looking to speak to someone who's had a double mastectomy with a particular type of implant or a specific type of flap, be it deep or tram flap, what have you, they're able to then really talk to somebody who's been there and there's such a value in that. Um, and I know that certainly at your practice as well, there's so many different options that are always presented when a patient comes to meet with you or one of the other plastic surgeons who specializes in all of these surgeries, because it can be overwhelming. And to hear that perhaps you can take a breath, you know, look at the options, know that you have these rights covered by insurance you know, that your your team is really there to support you every step of the way, be it in the initial part of that journey or down the road, if there are people that decide to delay the reconstruction. Um, and I do appreciate you sharing the, the flat movement as well, because we are hearing from more people that choose to, for whatever reason, um, you know, to either delay the reconstruction or say, you know what, that's not for me. Um, and to know that whatever choice people make is to one to be respected and what's right for the individual is in fact the right choice. Very, very well put, Angela. Thank you for, for saying that. You know, I, I deal with all types of uh, trauma as well um, as part of my interest, just to have a full breadth of reconstructive surgery outside of breast reconstruction. And there are accidents that people go through and traumas where they lose a limb. Mm -hmm. And there's a service that I started uh, with a prosthetist uh, getting involved with and recommending that's been life-changing for those, some of these people is to hear that their life isn't over. They hear directly from uh, an ath athlete who's lost a limb, that they're living a productive life doing the things that they love. Uh, from uh, you know, a, a chef or a certain demographic, uh, exactly from them culturally, that things are okay. And there are a lot of people uh, out there that I think uh, overlook how important it is to know that you're not alone. And outside of the wonderful team and resources that you have available to you from the doctors and the support group, um, are your your peers and the other survivors and and talking to them is invaluable to know that there is going to be an and 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 a light that you could move towards um, productively and uh, absolutely uh, very very overwhelming and and um, there is no right answer there just isn't and if you don't like something at some point and you say you know what I hate these implants I'd like to pursue autologous reconstruction okay pursue autologous reconstruction. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. You can always do that as long as you have a certain body type, as long as you're healthy enough. So I think the number one, two, and three thing is, like Angela said wonderfully, you take a breath, you process, you fight, lean on your team, and make a thoughtful decision. And one of the things I didn't mention, which came to my mind when you were talking, aside from the go-flat movement, is like the Goldilocks procedure um, uh, that I, I've, I've seen come across uh, social media recently where it's it's coupled with a go flat where you're having a, uh, using your own tissue to provide some degree of volume so that it doesn't look hollowed out. Uh, bottom line is, is there's lots of options to achieve your goals and, and having a, uh, um, a well-trained, competent surgeon um, and team will give you all the resources you need to succeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Parrish. You know, it's, there's been so many amazing takeaways from your presentation today, and I couldn't have said it better. The importance of really confidently choosing your plastic surgeon and your treatment team, which is all encompassing. And certainly the center of that team is the patient. The patient is the VIP, as we say. <laughs> Um, and it's so important that there's trust and support every single step of the way on this journey, not just for the person that has the diagnosis, but the people that they choose to call family and the family that surrounds them. Um, and it's really been a pleasure to have you here this afternoon. 
And I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule you know, to speak with us in the community. Um, I am looking at the chat. Please, if anyone in the audience has a final question, you can put that in, but certainly feel free to reach out to Dr. Parrish directly. Um, we have all of his contact information. If you don't aren't able to do that at this time, you can always reach out to the Adelphi New York Statewide Breast Cancer Hotline and Support Program. Please call our hotline. We're always available to help you. Oh, we have one more. Terrific. What is the lifespan of breast implants? Great question. Um, and this is something that people ask that do breast augmentation that go through breast cancer treatment. The implant is very similar to your breast in the sense that it has an envelope or uh, an outer capsule and a filling. Now that filling could be water, that filling could be silicone. One of the things I didn't really get into is, is if you go on ahead and you take a knife and you stab the water, like a balloon it goes, you know that it's out because you violated that outer capsule. If you stab a silicone implant, you, you may not know, you'll pick it up in screening. It maintains its form. Over time, specifically over the 10 year mark, the viability of that capsule on the outside just decreases with each year. So how long do they last? Most people will have them replaced between 10 and 20 years, closer to 15. And that's probably just based on the fact that you'll either develop some issues, a leak, a violation of that capsule. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, I like to use uh, certain implants because they have a 20 year warranty you know, on them. Um, I will say that um, that's the best way of thinking about it. It's not a specific timeline like milk uh, that expires, uh, but rather the integrity of that outer capsule that houses the filling just gets weaker with time. So somewhere between 10 and 20 years is when you tend to have issues, uh, but that's why it's important to maintain screening. Thank you so much. Okay. One uh, last one. What sure, type yeah. of so, MRI. One type? Mm -hmm. yeah. so go, so go ahead, Angela. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, the question was, is, I forgive me, Angela, was what, what type of screening is done on uh, silicone uh, implants? And it's MRI. Uh, current recommendations uh, have to do with uh, getting one um, at five, six year mark and every two to three years after that. Um, I think they'll try to stretch them out and change it. Um, but it, it would be an MRI or high resolution ultrasound. Um, there are lots of great places on the island. Um, I remember, to, and I have no affiliation with any of them. I just remember how easy it was to get in and out of Zwanger and Basiri, which is, I think was spot out by somebody else. It, it's, it's a small to do that you could do at some point. Um, it, it is a small inconvenience, but it's not a big thing. Uh, it, it's fairly quick. Uh, there are lots of open MRIs now. If you're claustrophobic, there's so many options. Why? Because you're not alone, like Angela was saying. You're not alone in the treatment options and, and, and your issues, and you're not alone with your support. Well said. Well, thank you again, Dr. Parrish, and to everyone who joined us, thank you so much for taking the time to be here this afternoon. It was a pleasure to have you here and to speak on all of this amazing topics and information. Um, please know to all of you in the audience, we're all here to help support you in any way that we can. Feel free to reach out to Dr. Parrish at his practice, as well as the Adelphi Breast Cancer Program. We wish you a restful and peaceful weekend. The sun is shining today on St. Patrick's Day for those who celebrate. And thank you again, everyone. This concludes our program today. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Take care. That was terrific, Dr. Parrish. Thank you for your time today. You're, you're wonderful, Angela. I really appreciate the work that you guys do. Thank you. Um, but, you know, like you're, you're acknowledging that, you, you know, you're respecting my time, but it's like participating in things like this really fill your cup, you know? So thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.